If you've wondered what it would be like to photograph wild horses on public lands, then this episode is for you. I'm your host, Carol Walker, and let's get started. Welcome to the Freedom for Wild Horses podcast, the place to find out about wild horses in the American West and what you can do to help them stay wild and free. If you love wildlife, wild horses, and the freedom that they stand for, this show is for you. I'm your host, Carol Walker. Let's get started. I'm going to give you some of my background and then some information on wild horses in America and where to find them, what type of equipment to use to photograph them, how to approach wild horses, and finally my suggestions on settings to use. I've been photographing horses for my living images business since 2000 and photographing wild horses since 2004. I used to teach workshops on horse photography, and I wrote a book to help people with some easy-to-follow guidelines, and it's called Horse Photography, The Dynamic Guide for Horse Lovers, which includes many things I'll be discussing in this episode. One of the very first things I would tell my students was the best way to improve your photographs of horses is to learn about horses, observe horses, Find out about horse behavior, because when you know your subject well, you're going to be able to predict their behavior, know what the more beautiful poses the horses can take, and find a way to capture moments when the horse is looking his best, and when your photograph can capture a sense of that horse's spirit. This is even more true of photographing wild horses than it is of photographing domestic horses. With domestic horses, we can get a handler to move the horse, have it stand in a particular place with a good background, or if it's under saddle, have the rider move it in a pattern that allows us to capture its movement. But when horses are in the wild, we may only catch a fleeting glimpse of a particular horse. We might see horses in one big mob with no way to isolate individuals. We may only see the horses grazing or napping. And when photographing in the wild, the biggest key to getting good photographs of horses is to learn their habits and patterns and spend time among them so that we know where the water holes are, when they might go to drink. Knowledge is the biggest key to getting good photographs of wild horses, not how expensive our gear is. There are wild horses on public lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management in 10 Western states. Arizona, California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Utah, and Wyoming. Nevada has the most wild horses, and Wyoming has the second most. If you want to visit a particular herd, I suggest Googling the state and the area. For example, you would type in Bureau of Land Management, Colorado, Wild Horses, and you'll come up with the four Colorado herd management areas. Then select an area, such as Samwash Basin. The website gives a description of the herd and the horses, and in the case of Samwash, a map of the area. Not all of the herd management areas have a map online. There are also many places that offer tours of wild horse areas, such as the Prior Mountain Wild Mustang Center in Lovell, Wyoming, which gives excellent tours of the Prior Mountain wild horses. If you go with a tour, your guides will know the habits of the horses and locations where they will most likely be found, and you don't have to risk your vehicle, since often the roads and the two tracks in the wild horse areas can be quite rough. I also suggest Googling to see where tours may be available, as well as looking on social media for Facebook groups on the herds, like Wild Horses of Samwash Basin, or Prior Mountain Mustang Center's page. You can often learn a great deal about the herd from the posts of other photographers. Of course, you can go out to visit wild horses on your own, and if you do, I have a few suggestions. First, do some online research about the area. A four-wheel drive vehicle is going to be the best choice to drive, as all of the areas are on dirt roads, and some are better than others. Get a map of the area you are planning to visit. The Bureau of Land Management has maps of the regions for sale in their field offices, but my favorite maps are the Delorme, Atlas, and Gazetteer maps. 
There is one for each state. They have really good detail, and you can order them online. When you go, make sure you have a good spare tire, plenty of water and snacks, and a cell phone. Binoculars are very helpful for spotting horses, and never go when it's muddy. You can become stuck. My favorite times to go and photograph wild horses are late spring and summer. Fall is a good time too, but winter can be really tricky, depending on the weather conditions. You do not want to become stuck or break down when it is very cold or there is deep snow. Why am I talking about preparing for a trip in a podcast about photographing wild horses? Because getting there and being prepared is the most important part. Once you've made it to a herd management area, that is when the challenge and fun begins because now you have to find some horses. Now I'll discuss camera equipment. These days, everyone has a cell phone. But in order to get really good images of wild horses, either a DSLR or a mirrorless camera are the best options. I am not going to recommend one brand of equipment over another. Canon, Sony, and Nikon all have great entry-level cameras in addition to top-end pro cameras. You do need a long lens to get photographs of wild horses while staying far enough away to respect them and to be safe and to allow you to observe them while not interrupting their natural wild behaviors. I suggest at minimum a 100 to 400 zoom lens or a fixed lens of 400, 500, 600, or 800 millimeters. I'm a fan of zoom lenses because they give you the flexibility of being able to zoom in close on a horse's face or zoom out to capture the horses amidst the landscape. I am currently using the Canon RF 100-500 to lens most of the time when photographing wild horses. It is light and I can handhold it because it has terrific vibration reduction to keep images sharper. When I was using a 600 lens, which is much heavier, I used a monopod to steady my shots and improve focus. When hiking with a 600 became too much for my back, I switched to a mirrorless camera and the lenses because they're lighter and the quality is amazing. If you are just starting out and not quite ready to invest in expensive gear, I suggest renting equipment from either your local camera store or a lens rental company like lensrentals.com so you can see if you like it before you buy it. I also suggest having a spare charged camera battery with you at all times. It's no fun once you've hiked to find some horses having your battery die. I also always have extra memory cards with me because you never know when you might have an amazing opportunity and fill up your card with images. Also, be sure to bring your instruction manual with you in case you need to figure out how to adjust your camera. One of the most important aspects of photography is using the light. The most beautiful light is from just before dawn to about two hours after, and then the last two hours before sunset and just after. Those are the golden hours. You can find apps for your phone that will give you sunrise and sunset times for where you are, which can be very helpful. I plan my drive out to the horse area I'm visiting so that I arrive just before dawn. Wild horses are usually most active in the early morning or late afternoon, especially when it's hot in the summer. You are most likely during those times to find wild horses running to water, a truly thrilling sight, or foals playing and stallions fighting. Although those behaviors can happen at all different times during the day, no day with wild horses is ever the same. They do not necessarily stay in the same areas, nor do the same behaviors from day to day. However, your best bet for getting good photographs of wild horses is to find areas they frequent, find the water holes, and spend time glassing with your binoculars. If you can get up on a hill that offers a good vantage point, that can be very helpful in finding horses. Finding your subjects can be the most challenging part of photographing wild horses. So I recommend when visiting a new area, give yourself more than a day or two to explore and get to know the area and the horses. I return over and over again to the same areas 
because the more time I spend there, the more I get to know the area, as well as get to know the horses. I find out which stallion has a new mare, which mares have new foals, and what older stallion may have lost his family to another stallion. Getting to know the horses and the different family bands gives life to my experiences and to my images. There are times I cannot find any horses, and times when there is no easy way to get to the ones I do find. But this is all part of photographing any wildlife. I was talking about light earlier, and there are different directions of light that you can take advantage of when photographing wild horses. For example, I like to shoot using direct light, which is when the sun is behind you and your subject is in front of you. This is when you will get the most detail in your images. Now, backlight can be very dramatic. This is when you are pointing your camera at your subject into the sun. Detail becomes obscure, and you can get some beautiful silhouettes. One of my more memorable morning sessions was when just before dawn, I was up on a hill in Saltwells Creek in Wyoming, and a huge group of horses went running in front of the sun as it was coming up. The orange sky and the running silhouettes were spectacular and so exciting to photograph. When I go out before dawn, I always try to find a group of horses that I can photograph in front of the sun. This works just as well in the evening as the sun is setting. Different weather conditions can also be very dramatic. I love a day with dark storm clouds in the sky as a backdrop. Foggy days can also be beautiful, giving a mysterious feeling to the scene. Snowing can be wonderful, and sometimes the autofocus on the camera will try to focus on the falling snow and not the horse, so in that case, I recommend switching to manual focus. When you've found some wild horses and they're not moving away from you, how do you approach them? I get out of my car and get my equipment slowly and quietly and watch the horses carefully as I approach. If one or more members of the family or group looks nervous, shifting around, or snorting, I have gotten closer than they feel comfortable. When I think I might be at a good distance and the horses are not moving away from me, I often sit down and try not to sit on cactuses. It's not fun, I can tell you. And then just watch them. Wild horses are most often taking a mid-morning nap, especially when there are young foals. And I've spent many hours with groups of wild horses who are sleeping. When they start to wake up, the foals get up to nurse, the stallions may breed the mares, or have scuffles with other stallions, and the mares may groom each other. It's a great time to observe and photograph behavior. A large part of getting good shots is paying attention to what may be happening. If a mare starts moving in the direction of a waterhole and the family starts to follow, I'll go to the waterhole and wait for the horses to come in and drink because I don't want photographs of the horses walking away from me, but I'd rather have them walking toward me. But never get between a mare and a foal, or a stallion and his mares, and don't get too close to the horses. The idea is not to interfere with their lives, but to watch and become part of their natural world for the brief time you are there with them. Being alert to what's going on around you is important. I have had to run from stallions who are running and fighting each other and paying no attention to me in the Prairie Mountains. And one of my favorite shots of the wild stallion Washakie in McCullough Peaks was when he suddenly started running toward me, chasing off a bachelor stallion. I stepped behind my vehicle to get out of the way and started shooting as he ran and he looked at me as he went by, mane flying in the air. Now I'm going to talk about the more technical aspects of photographing wild horses, what settings to use. I love to shoot action, whether it's a family running to a waterhole, two young stallions play fighting and running, a foal leaping, a stallion trying to steal a mare, or a large group of horses running together just for the sheer joy of being alive. When I'm photographing action, I do not use P for program or A for automatic. This is a sure way to get blurry images. So I use shutter priority. Canon calls this TV. This allows me to set the shutter speed so I can freeze the action. I usually set my shutter speed at 1 1,000th. 
This is enough to freeze a horse at a full gallop. And then the camera sets the aperture, depending on how much light there is. I have to change my ISO settings, depending upon the light. ISO measures the sensitivity of your image sensor. The lower the number, the less sensitive to light, and the higher the number, the more sensitive it is to light. Usually on a bright sunny day, I'll have my ISO at 400 to 640. But if it's darker, I will go up to 800, 1600, or even 2000. The higher my ISO, the more possibility of noise in the image, but the newer cameras handle lower light situations really well. Light changes as the day progresses, and also as I move around to different locations. So I always want to be checking my settings. Another setting you can use is Aperture Priority, or AV. This works well for portraits when the horses are standing still. You select the aperture number, and the camera will automatically select a shutter speed. If you want to blur the background of your image, which focuses more attention on your subject, you'll want a lower aperture, like 5.6. However, I do not recommend you go lower than that because horses have depth in their faces, and you might have the eyes in focus, but not the nose. If you want the whole image to be sharp, like when there's a big group of horses, or you want the horse and the background sharp, you would set your aperture high at f22 or f32. You can also shoot on manual, M, mode, instead where you are setting both the shutter speed and the aperture. Isolating your subject is important. Sometimes wild horses can get into large groups with many families, like the McCullough Peaks herd, and the whole thing can look like a blob with heads one way, tails out of the frame. Not a very interesting image. So I take the time to either wait until the horses move or move to a different vantage point where I can isolate one or two horses, perhaps zoom in on a face to get a more interesting image. Also, think about your background. If there's a fence or something not very pretty in the background, try moving to a different angle. Unlike with photographing domestic horses, you can't get a handler to move them to a better position but you have your two feet and you can move. But sometimes wild horses don't want you on that side of them. So be aware if you're moving around disturbs them. I want to encourage you to try different things and see what you like. Digital photography allows us to look at the images we have taken and get a sense if the settings need to be changed in the field. This is invaluable if you want to learn and improve your images. The more time you spend shooting, and the more time you spend with the wild horses, and the more you learn about them, the more your photographs will improve. Above all, allow yourself to drink in the magic of spending time with these magnificent beings, who are our national treasures and some of the best parts of our wild lands. Thank you for listening to this episode of Freedom for Wild Horses. You can find my book, Horse Photography, The Dynamic Guide for Horse Lovers, at www.wildhoofbeats.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Freedom for Wild Horses. If you want to learn more, follow me at www.wildhoofbeats.com for more information and for ways to help America's wild horses. See you next time.